you define discipling? You're if teaching. Discipling is teaching. Teaching to follow Jesus. There. Do they think of discipling their children? No, not usually. Now they think of disciplining their children. They're very close words, discipling and discipline, very, very close words. They come from the same root. So they always think of dis disciplining their children. They don't think of discipling necessarily their children, discipling. So that's what we want to talk about today a little bit. Uh, the lesson when it's a various, I mean, the lesson, I don't know if you followed the lesson or read the lesson this week on discipling children. It went all over the place. I mean... I mean, yeah, so we're going to do some of it. We're not going to do all of it. Um, but we're going to do this within the context, remember, of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So if you kind of go back to Matthew 28, and Jesus, before he leaves the earth, is giving this task to his disciples and saying, go and what? And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And what else? Teaching. Teaching them to observe all the things that I have told you and taught you. And, you know, I'm, I'm with you always with that. So, discipling, make disciples of all nations which includes, you know, we think about go, you know, to a distant country, go to another part of the country or earth, and um, making disciples, evangelizing or whatever. But what about the little disciples in your own house? Making disciples of those, of the children or your grandchildren. Or the young people in your church family. So we're going to get the basis for that, and it really starts way back, and, and we talked about baptizing, immersing them. Baptizing is immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Immersing them in the character, the love of God, the whole Godhead. That's what baptiz baptizing should, should be. When you, when you flesh it out, immersing them in the love, the name, the character of God. Well, let's go to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. And this is where it goes back. And the lesson only focused on two verses. And I think they missed the whole boat. They should have done the whole chapter. So we're going to look at the whole chapter, which is 25 verses. But they focus on these verses here. These words which I am commanding you today, that's verse 6, shall be on your heart, in verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. That's all that they had in the lesson. And you miss kind of the context, and, and you miss the keys, the key elements here. And so we're going we're gonna to enumerate them, because this is the way to disciple children. This is the way to disciple children, is the whole chapter. Instead of just saying, well, you should teach them diligently to your sons. There's more to this whole chapter. So let's go back to the very first verse in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. We're going to try to enumerate those because this tells you how to disciple children. Verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. Now what is the context? The context here is, this is Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy means what? What does it mean? Do you know? Why do they call it Deuteronomy? 
What's a duet? Two people. Two people. Deuteronomy has to do with second. It's the second fleshing out or giving of the law. And when did this happen? Well, when did the first, when did the first giving of the law happen? Hmm? Exodus. Exodus. And what time in Exodus? I mean, what, what event? Or what, what are we talking about in Exodus? There's a lot in Exodus. Okay, it was early on, right after Mount Sinai. Okay, after Mount Sinai. When they start building the tabernacle and they set up the tabernacle and all of the sacrifices and all of the rules were given at that time. Now, this is 40 years later, practically. They've gone through their wandering in the wilderness. They're about ready to go into Canaan. It's towards the end of that 40 days. Moses is still with them. Moses is about ready to die. These are his last instructions to them. Do you think it's important? Do you think he was giving them the important stuff here? It's kind of like it's his last time to reemphasize to them what they need to do. And it mentions this as we go through this chapter. So this is the context. This is the second giving of the law. The second giving of the law, Deuteronomy. And so Moses is emphasizing to them what it is they need to do as a family. What, to be, what are parents supposed to be doing with their children? Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, this is Moses speaking, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. So that, verse 2, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. So this is the context. This is the, the introduction. Like, this is, the, this, is, this is important. This is important. This is where you want to listen because he starts out in verse 4, hear, O Israel. Like, listen up. Listen up. And the following verses are important. So as we go through them, let's enumerate what are the, are the steps or what are the characteristics, what are the necessary ingredients in discipling children. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You know, you, you, you read that. And you th do you think much about that when it says, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one? Does that really, you know? What? <laughs> or does it mean that he is the only one? <laughs> oh, it says, okay. Parentheses, yours says the only one. Well, what does it mean there? The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. I mean, is that earth-shaking to you? I mean, is that... Why would they start out with that, too? The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Any ideas? I don't know if they... We think of the Trinity, but I don't know if they had that concept. Did they have a concept of more than one person in the Godhead? Well, they would have if they read Genesis. Because Genesis would have told them that God was, God was plural. They lived in a polytheistic place. And this is pointing out, we don't worship God and Chemosh and Molech and all these others, only God. Okay, yes. You've got to think of the context. The context is the nations around them worshiped they were polytheists. There were many, many gods. In fact, like Egypt, where they just came, they had come out of slavery out of Egypt, they had gods for everything. They had the sun god, they had the Nile god, they had the fly god, 
they had the cattle, the bull god. I mean, that's why they had, you know, they had this golden calf. They had the calf god. They had all these gods. In fact, God, the plagues were intended for what? To inflict punishment on the Egyptians? No, it was to show how powerless those gods of Egypt were to the God of Israel. That was the purpose. That's why the sun got darkened. That's why the, the Nile got turned to blood. That's why, you know, that's why the cattle suffered. I mean, that's, this was to prove that the gods of Egypt were impotent. And so even the sun, an S-U-S-O-N God, you know, the son of the Pharaoh was revered. The firstborn son was revered also in those cultures as gods. So these plagues were meant, and so the cultures around them, all of the cultures around them had polytheism, many gods. I mean, even the Greeks had all of these, you know, gods, and the Romans had all these. So this is important. It says our God is one. It may be plural in Trinity, but it is one. God is one. You don't have one God against another God, you know, or who's superior to this God, or who has this attribute that the other one doesn't have, like all of the other gods that were in the heathen and pagan nations around them. All right, so this is where you start out with. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. First step. Uh-oh. This isn't working. Okay, first step. What's the first step? Love God. Love God with all important, all what? Heart, soul, and might, and might. All right, first step. If you're going to disciple your children, love God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now, you know, I was really surprised to see this. So that the words, or God's law... is on their heart. Now, we, were, we studied that already. Or hearts or minds, okay? But already this concept goes way back. I mean, we thought, oh, this was a new concept that God wanted the law written on their hearts. But this concept was at, right at the beginning of the, of the law. It wasn't like, okay, this is a new covenant now. I want the law given on your hearts, you know. Before it was like, well, just performance only, you know, just do the external rituals and so on. But now the new covenant is I want it on your heart. No, this was from the very beginning. This was the everlasting covenant. This, is, this has been God's purpose all along, is that his law would be incorporated into our lives. Because that's the way the law is. The law is the reality of the way God is and how he's created the universe. All right. So the next thing is not only to love God <clears throat> with all your heart, soul, and might, but that his law would be written on the parents' hearts. Then what else? What's the next thing? Okay. So then you have to teach them. And, and it's interesting to teach them how. Teach diligently. What is that? With energy and dedication. <laughs> With energy and dedication. Is it just to the males only? Teach them diligently to your sons. Oh, yours is to the children? Okay. Yeah. It, it's, it's both genders. And what else? You not only teach them. Right. 
that teaching them is part of the diligently is that it is what? It is not only in your house, but outside your house. It says when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, so it's not just going to be confined to your house. This teaching is not going to just be confined. Well, it's just, you know, we, we're only going to do this just here. This doesn't apply to when you're out there. But these are the rules of the house, and you must obey them, and, you know, this is it. No, this is going to be for everything. This is not just when you're at home. You know, this, this applies to life in the house, out the house, with the neighbors, relatives, friends, And when you lie down and when you rise up, what does that mean? What's what? When you're resting and when you're acting. When you're resting and when you're acting. As long as you're awake. As long as you're awake, okay? Discipling. Discipling versus disciplining. All right, so, you know, this has been interpreted as, well, you should have morning and evening worship. That's how it was interpreted in my house when I was growing up, right? When you lie down and when you get up. So that's what we would have in our house when I was growing up. That was, that was kind of the, 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 the you know... The, the rule to follow. You know, we'd have morning and evening worship. But is that what it means? I mean, they certainly had morning and evening sacrifice. I think the bigger context is, I mean, I don't mind emphasis on morning and evening worship. Believe me, I'm not knocking that. <laughs> but, but, but I think the context means it means all the time. It means all the time and everywhere. It's inside your house, outside your house, morning, evening. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, you're right, all your waking hours. It's, yeah, it's a whole life thing. It's not confined to a certain area. You know, it's, just, it's, it's like, kind of like church. You know, church is not confined to the hours of 9.30 a.m. to 12 noon. You know, or your or your worship experience. You know, for some people, their their worship experience, their religious experience is from 11 to 12 a.m. on Sabbath mornings or Sunday mornings or wherever. You know, it, it should be more than that. You got to be a lot more holistic. Those are emphases and those are special times, but that is not when it's just relegated, you know, only to a certain time or hours or day. It's not an outward form of uh, a performance that you do. It's an inward motivation of who you are. Okay. All right. So you teach them diligently by, by its timed and location. So it's everywhere all the time. And you shall bind them as a sign. Now, this is a good one. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So what did the Jews do with that one? They took that literally. Remember Jesus said you, have these, you wear these phylacteries? They would actually have scripture and put in little things and tie them around their head, put them over their forehead, and they'd put them on their, on their wrists. Because that's what it says. And they would actually write them on their doorposts or to attach them to their gates. You know, Dave, have actual copies of Scripture and put them there. Dave, to me, that's what was part of the problem with the Israelites is that they put it on paper instead of in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And in their hand, to me, means that whatever I do with my hands, I do it with all my might, with the love of God. And on my forehead means that I think about it day and night and that I turn my mind over to Christ. 
So the hand uh, is not necessarily a form. Okay, good. So this is all the time, everywhere. It's like our schools were taught up to teach the mind, the hand, and the heart. So right. with our hand, we teach the children to do labor and to do a good job. So God's law then is not, you're right, it's not literal, the words, you know, stuck and attached to your forehead or your arm, but it's God's law is to govern your actions, that's what you do with your arms, and thoughts. That's why it's on your forehead. That whole idea of forehead, you know, goes all the way to Revelation, you know. The mark is on their forehead. It's not this literal stamping of some, you know, that's our, that's our thought you know tattoo or something on your forehead. It's talking about what's, in, what's getting impressed on your on your brain, on your thoughts. All right. So that God's law would govern your actions and your thoughts, and what else? What's next? And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So God's law not only governs your actions and thoughts, but God's law governs what happens in the home, what happens in your property, it's in your gates. All right. So these are not just to be like, oh, things that you know, you do on Sabbath or just you do at church or just at certain times. This is, this is, look at, this is a pervasive thing that's going throughout your whole life. But the emphasis is in certain places, particularly in your home. All right. Then it says, then it shall come about that when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. So when God fulfills his promise and rewards them, then, verse 12, watch yourself. Watch yourself. Things are going great. Things are going good. God has blessed you. Watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Okay? Next step. Don't forget. One of the reasons for the Sabbath is what? So they will remember. It says, remember the Sabbath day. That's God's way of helping us not forget. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you will worship him and swear by his name. So part of not forgetting, you see, is to worship God. That's why we have the Sabbath worship so that you won't forget. Seven. What's next? <clears throat> you shall not follow other gods. Any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. Okay? So not only do you not forget the Lord God, but don't follow other gods of the peoples around you. Does that apply to us? Big time. I mean, are there other gods out there in the peoples around us? For the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord God will be kindled against you and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. 
Does that sound like a really angry God? Like, you know, if you don't, if you don't love me, you go after those other gods, I'm just going to wipe you out. Does that sound very loving? And we talked about that already, about, so I don't want to get into that. But It can sound very stern, but it's also a reality. If you do not follow God, the true God, and, and, and align yourself in accordance with his principles and his law, if you're, not, if you're out of harmony with that, you're going to suffer bad consequences, just like anyone else who gets out of harmony with any of, of the natural laws. You go against the law of gravity, you, you break things, you fall. All right. If you don't, you know, if you don't put energy into things, things do what? They decay. You know, it's the law of entropy. You got to put energy in it to maintain it, preserve it. If you don't, it just decays, it goes downhill. You increase entropy. It's the law of thermodynamics. So these laws are just natural laws. You either you either put yourself in harmony with them or you don't. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in them or not, they still will apply to you. You don't have to believe in the law of gravity, but I mean, you know, if you jump off a cliff, you will go down. Unless you, unless you have the, law, law, the other law of, ther- of aerodynamics. Now, if you have the law of aerodynamics on your side, you won't go down, right? So you, it's, it's, still, it's, it's still whether you're in harmony with a law or not. All right. So, the next one is, the most curious one, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Does, this, does that verse sound familiar? Don't put the Lord to the test. What? Deuteronomy 6. And that is uh, verse 16. Yep. Now, what does that mean? Who, who used this verse, by the way? Yeah, Jesus used this verse. He quoted this verse. When did he use that verse? When did, he, when did Jesus use this verse? Against Satan. Against Satan? When Satan was trying to tempt him in the wilderness, right? After the 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, and Satan came to him, and, and he said, um, talking about the laws of gravity, <laughs> he said, jump off this cliff. Because the scripture says, you want to answer me with scripture, and I'll give you scripture. The scripture says, you know, he will send his angels to bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So you can jump off here. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this one in particular, but you know, there's, there's talking about what was this putting God to the test? And especially it says, you tested him at Massa. What happened there? Anyone know? This was all around faith. This was all around a lack of faith of the children of Israel. After God had provided for them, had miraculously delivered them, had done one miracle after another, and they still complained and showed lack of faith in his ability to provide for them and to protect them. That's what it was. That's what testing God is. God has provided ample evidence, and they still doubt. They still complain. They still wail and moan and gripe and, you know, whatever despite all that God has already done for them. Okay? You know, that's what we call the, you know, the 49er fans who lost last weekend. We call them the 40 whiners. (laughs) That's because all I could hear after that was, oh, you 40 whiners, just give it up. All right. So, don't put the God to the test. Then next. Keep the commandments diligently. This is also diligently. Diligently keep the commandments. Now remember, this is all in the context of discipling your children. This is the hardest one. Keep the commandments. 
Why is this the hardest one when you're trying to teach your kids? If you want disciplined kids, what do you need? Disciplined parents, exactly. Disciplined children need self-disciplined parents. This is the hardest part of all. Yes? Both number eight and number nine have to do with trust. Okay. If you are testing well, you're not trusting him. And if you don't trust him to know what's good for you and what you, how you should order your life, then you don't do what he says. Okay, Anne was saying that both eight and nine are part of trust and faith. Yeah. Yes, they are related. But this is specific. It's, it's, it's you, the parents have to be the example, right? The parents have to set the example. Are they going to be perfect? No. But they, that, that's even part of the mentoring. That is part of the discipline is saying, look, we're not perfect. You're not perfect. But when we realize we've made a mistake, we are, we, are, we are willing and able to confess our sins. We are able to ask for forgiveness. We are able to apologize. We're able to make things right. That's the difference between someone who's converted and not converted. And you can mentor that. It's impossible to mentor perfection, folks. <laughs> Personally, you can't mentor perfection, but you, you can also mental mentor the growth of the Christian life and the growth of the, you know, of, the, of, the, of the person. You can mentor that. What is the proper response in your, in your spiritual growth? All right. So you have to keep that. Diligently keep them. And then, <clears throat> verse 20. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean? which the Lord our God commanded you, then you shall say to your son. So the next step in discipline is not only do you keep the law and the commandments and God's law yourself, but when your children ask you, you explain them. You explain the law. You have to be able to do that. And not just say, because I told you so. That's not good enough. It may be good enough when they're three, and they can't reason that much anyway, but when they get to being adolescents, that's not good enough. Because I say so. Because I'm your dad. Because I'm your mom. Yes, Neil. Good point. It's like... Um... Remember Eli's big mistake, you know, look what happened to Hophni and Phineas. So I think a lot, sometimes people think, well, don't bother the kids, don't pester them, don't, but no, it's our duty to correct them in love, you know, and I don't always do that, right, Rick? <laughs> I try. <laughs> you got to be careful what you say, how you're sitting next to your <laughs> right. son there. <laughs> but it is a challenge. A parent is like the hardest job I've ever had, but as I pray for them, I think that's a big part too, and try to be an example, but definitely correct them. All right. He corrects me a lot. Yeah, it's sometimes a mutual street, isn't it? Two-way street. But if you don't, because it even says, those who the Lord loves, he corrects, he disciplines. If you don't discipline, you in a way are showing you don't care. You know, you don't care. Is that what you want your kids to feel? That you don't care? That no matter what they do, you don't care? And there's a difference between no matter what they do, you will still love them versus no matter what they do, you don't care. You know, there's a, there's a big difference there. And both could kind of look the same on the outside. All right, then lastly, it says, then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. And he brought us out 
from there in order to bring us in to give us the land which he has sworn to our fathers. Okay. So not only do you explain, and you have to explain God's laws correctly, that the laws are natural laws that are just the basis, the fabric, the foundation of the universe. And you go against those, you, you break those, you don't make God mad, you just make yourself destructible. You know, you just, you're out of harmony with life. But you know, not only do you explain the law, but then you must recount. You know, recount how God has worked. Recount. I think some of the most, the best lessons that we would make in our family to our kids sometimes is to recount and say, look, look what happened. Look how God led us, how God blessed us, how God shaped things to happen the way things happened this past year or this past month or this past week or over the last decade or so. Recount, recount, recount. Keep those things alive and fresh in their minds. But it's very important how you explain God's laws. <clears throat> you don't want to make God out to be that he makes up laws to his best interest and enforces them to please himself. That's not a good view of God. You know, God set up these rules, he imposed these rules on you, and they're in his best interest, and he enforces them to please himself. Nor is he a demanding, coercive God who doesn't respect our personal freedom of choice. In fact, he gave us the freedom of choice instead of programming us as robots. Nor is he a God who does not care what we do or how we treat ourselves or others. As long as we provide him with a correct payment. God is interested in what you do with yourselves and with others because that's the way things were created. Because what you do to yourself and to others affects yourself and other people. You're not a, an, an isolated molecule or being in the universe that has no effect on everything else. Everything in the universe, you know, I mean, I, you don't want to get too naturalistic here, but I mean, all these things where, you know, everything is tied together and plants and animals and human beings are all, all this one great big cosmos of energy and life and all this kind of stuff. We are, to some extent, we are. That when one of us goes missing, it does affect it. It's just like when you take out a tree in, in the forest, it affects a bunch of other stuff in there affects the whole ecology. Well, when you take out one human being, that, that does the same thing. To some degree, it's, a, it's influencing other parts of the universe. All right. Um, I just wanted to, they, they, they made this here, Jeremiah 731. <laughs> and it was, it was in reference to that God, you know, some of the other religions that were surrounding the children of Israel, the nations that they were going in to displace, one of their rituals was to sacrifice children to the gods. That was, that was, a, that was a thing to do. Sacrifice your children to the gods. Burn them in fire or whatever. Sacrifice them. Human sacrifice. And so... Um, God says, I didn't do that. I never commanded that. I never want you to do that. And so would we do that? Would we ever think of doing that? You say, God, how, how horrible, how pagan, how cruel to offer your kids to some God, you know, just sounds horrible, doesn't it? But, you know, if you really think about it, We sometimes do the same thing. We don't physically offer them as a sacrifice to some god we worship, to appease some god, but maybe we do. But we do sacrifice our children many times to gods we worship. It could be the god of money, 
It could be the God of career. It could be the God of fame. It could be the God of whatever. And we sacrifice our kids. Just like Eli. And Eli was doing a good thing. I mean, he was high priest. And he sacrificed his sons. But the other extreme, I mean, so we have, we have that extreme where people are sacrificing their children to other gods, to serve other gods, if not even themselves as God. But also we have the other extreme. It's where they make the children gods. And now everything is subservient to the kids. Whatever the kids want, you know, they get. And everything is for the kids. They protect the kids and give them this and give them that. Don't let them suffer. Don't let them have any pain. Don't let them go without. We've got that culture now. And then we wonder, why do the kids think everything revolves around them? Why do we think they're so self-indulgent? his child grow up to do the same thing that he does even though the child may have an interest in another line of work but the father forces and sacrifices him to the kind of work that he has we make our children do a lot of things that they don't want to do well there is that coercive you know demanding type parent all right um Let's go real quickly. There's, they, in the lesson, they had four stories of healing. I want to cover those briefly. All right, so this is the way to disciple, but, you know, when you disciple, things don't always go right. What do you do when things don't go right? Well, there's four stories that was in the lesson about parents and kids. So, um, let's go over those real fast. Okay, the first one is in uh, Luke 8, 41 to 56. Luke 8, 41 to 56. And anyone know what that story is? Can you encapsulate it? Jairus? Okay. All right. There's two stories within this story, but we're talking about the parent-child relationship here. So... <clears throat> Jesus is um, getting surrounded by a throng, and the two stories intersecting are Jairus, who has a 12-year-old only daughter who is sick and dying, and the woman who's been hemorrhaging for years who is trying to win needle her way through the crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment so that she'd be healed, and she is. And so... That you have the story within a story, and it's a fascinating comparison if you, if you look at that, the, the parallels there. So Jairus is uh, wanting Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter who's dying. So this is Jairus' daughter, only daughter, and she's how old? Twelve. And... Um, she, she is dying. Her condition is she's, she's ill. Ill to the point of death. So she's actually dying. And then as the story goes, she ends up dying. I mean, right after Jesus heals, the, or after he heals, he heals the hemorrhaging woman, he gets the news that she died already. And they're saying, don't bother all right, next one, the next story is in um, Luke 9. Well, that is Luke 9. Sorry. Let's go back. Oh, 
There is Luke 9. Yeah, Luke 9. We'll go to Luke 9. I'll save you a step from going back and forth, back and forth. Okay, Luke 9, 20, 37. And this is after Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And who was with him? Peter, James, and John. But the other nine were down at the bottom of the mountain. And so what had happened was this guy has a son who's got a problem. And he tries, he asks them to heal him. And what happens? They, they fail, right? So then when Jesus comes down from the mountain, then he approaches Jesus. So this is in um, 37. All right. So on the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him, and a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. Oh, so here is an only son. So this is an only son. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth, and only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. So what did this kid have? Did he have an unclean spirit? Sounds like he had epilepsy to me. Yeah, I think he had a seizure disorder. So he had a seizure disorder. And what had happened was he already had a failed healing by even the teacher's own followers. Okay. Third one. Let's go to Mark 7. Mark 7. in the wrong direction here. Mark 7, verse 24. Jesus got up and went away and from there to the region of Tyre. So where's Tyre? Where's Tyre? T-Y-R-E. Not T-I-R-E. Where is Tyre? What country? It's a city in what country? Phoenicia. Phoenicia. But it's the modern country of Phoenicia. Hmm? Palestine, well, northern Palestine. Lebanon. Lebanon is where Tyre and Sidon are located. I was, I was there when I went to... Uh, to um, Jerusalem. No, actually, I didn't go to, no, I don't went to Jerusalem. I went to um, Beirut. When I went to Beirut, I got to visit Tyre and Sidon. Um, and it was interesting. I, say, I know I've heard of those cities, you know. It's, 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 it's a pretty cool place. And um, anyway, so Tyre is in Lebanon. That's outside of Palestine. That's outside of Israel. That's what, what, what country is that? Lebanon. But what is that? To the Jew, that was what? That's Gentile country. You know, that's, that's riffraff. That's, that's, they don't belong. So you have this mo mother who has a daughter with an unclean spirit. Uh, and so she came and immediately fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter and he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Ooh, ooh, ouch. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. 
good one, good response. And he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Okay, so we have a demon possessed daughter. All right, last one. Um, John 4. John 4, verses 46. This is the healing of a nobleman's son. Therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. Remember that? And there was a royal official whose son was sick in Capernaum. So we're not, we're in the same region of Galilee, kind of, but not really. We're, we're far away to Capernaum. Cana was closer to Nazareth and Jesus' hometown, but Capernaum is up in the northern Galilee, uh, Sea of Galilee shore. <laughs> shore area. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better, and then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. So here we have, we have the father the nobleman's son with a fever who's dying. All right. What do these all have in common? What do all these have in common? They all had faith. The reason... Jesus was able to do the healing was because of faith on the parents' part. All of them were desperate. Remember Pastor Dennis's overdue, D-U-E? One is desperation. Well, they had that one. They had desperation. Okay. Did they have anything else? They had urgency. But they also had expectation, D-U-E. Desperation, urgency, and expectation. They had faith that God would heal them. If your children are not doing well, in fact, the lesson asks, what is harder, to, to see them physically dying or to mourn their physical loss or to watch spiritual decay? And, they, and the lesson said, well, they're about equal. And I'm going, are you kidding me? What's worse? For you see them to mourn their physical death or to watch their spiritual decay. What is worse? Yeah, to me, spiritual decay is worse. Because that could be one from which there is no resurrection. I mean, not a good resurrection. So you lose them physically. I mean, that is a loss, but nothing compared to the spiritual loss. Would you rather lose them temporarily here on earth or lose them forever in heaven or in the earth made new. I mean, I, I, just, I, I just could compute that one. But we need to look at these. The parents went to God. I mean, if your kids aren't doing well, even they're dying or they're dead or they're apparently dead, God can still work miracles amazingly. So even when you see spiritual decay, God can still work miracles. But it depends on the faithfulness and the faith of the parent. That's why praying parents are a good thing. I wanted to share you one thing. Our daughter, who works in my office, writes children's books. And she came out with three books. 
well, the first book, she said, I want to write a children's book. So guess what? She writes her first book. And this is Arlo, the character she created, a little elephant. Says, Arlo goes to the dentist. I go, what? Your first book? I'm your dad? I'm a doctor? I'm a pediatrician? And you write your first book? Arlo goes to the dentist? How dare you? Then she says, well, I'm going to write another book. Oh, okay. What's that one going to be? Oh, she started with dentists. Yeah, okay, she's going to write about doctors. Arlo and the airplane. I'm going, what? Arlo on the airplane? What, what's that have to do with a doctor? She says, well, I'm going to write a third book. Okay, okay, now she's going to get around to, you know, go, Arlo goes to the doctor, right? No, I want him to be healthy. Well, that's a good start, I guess. So is he going to go to the doctor? No. Arlo goes to the farmer's market. And I'm going like, oh, I've lost it. What's, got, what's happened here? Well, it just arrived yesterday, this hardbound book. just arrived at our house. We got boxes of this book and this one. And so, you know, on those other books she had written, her sort of like dedication of the book, for Hudson, Helena, Ava, and Spencer, my favorite little kids in the world. These are her nephews and nieces, my grandkids. And she wrote that on these first two books. So lo and behold, this book. We opened it up, and we read this. For Padre and Madre, the healthiest people I know, you are an inspiration. And that was real moving. So she doesn't have to write a book about going to the doctor, and I don't care. <laughs> but, you know, I thought about that. Here she's put in all of this work into this book, and I'm thinking, you know, we are books. We are living books. And why couldn't our books, our lives say, to my heavenly Father, my life is a book dedicated to you, and you, my Heavenly Father, this is for you. My life is dedicated to you, my Heavenly Father, the most awesome God I know. You are an inspiration. Let's pray. Father in Heaven, thank you so much for sharing the gifts of procreation with us. Sometimes we wonder if it's really a gift, but you have said in your word that children are a gift from you. And through the trials and the tribulations and the effort and the time and the energy and the resources that are brought to bear in raising these little ones, it does give us a picture of what you have to do in dealing with us. It gives us such a richer picture that we would never understand if we didn't have some of these experiences ourselves. And each of us have had to go through our childhood and our adolescence, and our young adulthood, and our older ages, and our parenting sometimes. And we get a fuller and deeper understanding of how you've had to deal with us, and how the losses that you have suffered are just as great. You have suffered both deaths. You have suffered the death of a decaying, spiritually decaying individual in Lucifer. And you suffered the physical death of your son, Jesus Christ. You have gone through all of that, and you've done all of that for us. Thank you for that great gift of your forbearance and your love through all of that, and your wanting a relationship with us. May we respond in loving you with all of our heart and soul and might, and may we dedicate ourselves, our lives to you, that we may be faithful, that we might make disciples of our children whether it's our own or even these young little ones that are in our church family or our neighbors or our relatives or friends, whoever they may be. For these little ones are precious in your sight and they are the ones who will make up the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for that.
privilege and that responsibility, that awesomeness, and your willingness to help us even when things are not going right. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.